Good day, Grade 12. Welcome to our next lesson on mathematics in... Sorry, I was just reading a message. Um, <laughs> welcome to our next lesson in mathematics. Um, I have promised that I will be doing some circle geometry. I can't guarantee that it'll be on Friday because I don't think we'll be finished the paper by then. But what I can do is, I think it'll probably be by Monday. Um, but let's see how it goes. What I will do is, if it changes, then I will put it on the session manager, the, what we are doing on that day. Tomorrow is Friday, so I'm not 100% sure that we will be finished this paper by then. Um, so let's aim for Monday when I will be working through, I've promised that I will be working through circle geometry theorems and then doing some riders, some problems based on circle geometry. Um, I know it's a very tricky section, so it needs to be done properly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to carry on going through this June common paper. Um, and then, like I said, as soon as I'm finished it, we will move on to the circle geometry, which will probably be Monday. Um, but let me let me talk to you about that at the end of this lesson. OK, so let's carry on with this. We were doing calculus and we had to determine using the shortcut method dy by dx if y is equal to 2 root x minus 3x over 5x squared. Um, right, so let's start. The first thing you need to do is to realize that we need a pen. Um, so let me get a pen out. And then you need to know your, so f of x is equal to ax to the n, then n dashed of x is equal to n a x to the n minus 1. And that is the formula that we need to use to solve this. Okay, but this is slightly tricky because it's got a third here and there's a fraction there. So we need to first make this look pretty before we can find the derivative and that's what we're going to do. So we know that y is equal to 2 root x minus 3x over 5x squared. So we need to change this into an exponent and we need to simplify this. So we're going to say y is equal to 2, and I'm really hoping you guys know that the square root of x is the same as x to the half minus, what can we do here? Well, we can cancel one of these x's at the top with one of the ones at the bottom. So we end up with 3 over 5 to the x. Okay, so it's 3 over 5 to the x, but the problem is, is that we cannot derive or find the derivative of anything that's at the denominator. We need to bring it to the top, and when we bring it to the top, it becomes a negative. So that becomes 2x to the half minus 3 over 5, x to the negative 1. And now we can apply this rule. Okay, so... Let's continue. We're going to say dy by dx is equal to, what do we do? We bring the half to the front. So we get a half times by 2x. And what do we do? We subtract 1 here. We go half minus 1 minus 3 over 5x. Sorry, but we've got to take this minus 1 to the front and multiply it. So we multiply by minus 1. And then it becomes x to the minus 1 minus 1. And you guys don't have to write this out if you guys are awesome at doing derivatives using the formula. But if not, I would suggest you write it out because it can be very easy to make mistakes. So the half cancels with the 2. And then you're left with x to the negative a half because a half minus 1 is minus a half. A minus times minus is a plus. It becomes plus 3 over 5. X to the minus 2. Now, knowing the question, does it say that you need to leave these in positive values? But I would suggest that you do. And in order to do that, we need to fix this by taking these across the divided line, the quotient line. Okay, remember there's an implied 
quotient line of over 1. So in order to do that, we'd go that is equal to 1 over x to the half is equal to 3, I mean, sorry, plus 3 over 5x squared. And you could even make that look nicer by going 1 over, this must be 1 there, the square root of x plus 3 over 5x squared. There you go. And that is your final answer. I personally would have been happy with that unless they said that you have to leave your answer with positive exponents. But I'm going further just in case they ever ask you to do that. Right, let's move on. Okay, so now we're going to look at applying our derivatives. Okay, so the graph says the graph of f of x is equal to x cubed minus 4x squared minus 11x plus 13. It's drawn here. A and b are turning points. So we immediately know that this value here is plus 30 because that is the constant which means it where it cuts the y-axis. Now the first question says determine the co coordinates of a and b. And what is special about the coordinates of a and b? They are the turning points. And at the turning points, the gradients are equal to what? They are equal to zero, which means f dashed of x is equal to zero at the turning points. So if I find the first derivative of this and I let it equal to zero and I factorize it and solve for x, I will find the x values of a and b. And then after that, I can find the y values of a and b. So let's do that. So we're going to go f dashed of x is equal to 3x squared take the 2 to the front becomes minus 8x minus 11 and that is going to equal 0 if I want to find these points here because the first derivative is a gradient and that has to be 0. So now I need to factorize this and yes you guys can use your calculator if you want but I'm going to do it the old-fashioned way. I'm going to say, well, my factors of 3 are 3 and 1. And my factors of 11 are obviously 11 and 1 and 1 and 11. 3 times 11 is 33, so it obviously can't be that. I want a negative, so the bigger number has to have a minus. Okay, so we're going to cross multiply. 3 times 1 is 3. 1 times negative 11 is negative 11. And we want it to equal minus 8, which means this has to be positive, which means that's plus, okay? So therefore, we've got 3x plus 1, and then we've got um, x minus, sorry, 3x, oh, what am I doing? We've got 3x minus 11, x plus 1 equals 0. Sorry, what I was thinking when I was writing was that if you guys are struggling with this at all, please come and watch my lessons. I think it is in grade 10 or grade 11, or grade 10, where I'm factorizing trinomials at the moment because I'm not going to go slower than that at the moment, okay, with this. So therefore, you've got, now I need to solve, so 3x, is equal to 11, so x is equal to 11 over 3, or x equals minus 1. So the x value of this is going to be minus 1 or something, and the x value of this is 11 over 3 or something. And now we need to find the y value. And the way we find the y value is to substitute these x values back into the original, back into the original. Okay, so we do that and we can do that by using our calculators. So let's get out our calculators. Okay. And I'm going to first substitute in 11 over 3. So I'm going to clear this and I'm going to go bracket. Oh, no, let's try again, delete. And I'm going to go 11 over 3 bracket to the sorry um, let's go this way and then go delete and then go there and then go close bracket to the power of 3 okay minus 4 bracket fraction 11 
over 3, move over close bracket squared, minus 11 bracket, 11 over 3, close bracket, plus, plus 30. And that equals minus 400 over 27, which means that it is going to be minus 14.81, minus 14.81. So this is minus, um, I'm going to write it as fraction 400 over 27, okay? That's great. Now we need to find the y value of this. So we're going to substitute back into that. I'm just going to put it in here. So it becomes minus 1 cubed minus 4 times minus 1 squared minus 11 times minus 1 plus 30 becomes minus 1 minus 4 plus 11 plus 30, which becomes 36. Okay, so therefore, this value here is 36. So the x coordinate and the y coordinates we now have for our turning points of A and B. Right, moving on. It now says determine the x coordinate of the point of inflection of F. Determine the x coordinate of the point of inflection of F. Now, what is important is for you guys to realize that the point of inflection is the second derivative. Okay, it's F double dashed of X. Now, I know I've just erased F dashed of X. I'm going to write it out again. Don't panic. So, let's just go back. So we know, let's write it here, f dashed of x is equal to 3x squared minus 8x minus 11. f double dashed of x is equal to 6x minus 8. And wherever that is equal to 0, that is going to be the x coordinate of the point of inflection. So we're going to let that equal 0. Therefore, 6x equals 8. Therefore, x is equal to 8 over 6. So, that x is equal to 4 over 3 or 1 and a third. Okay, happy with that. Let's move on. Now, it says determine the equation of the tangent to f at x equals 2. At x equals 2. Well, this here is 11 over 3, which is about 3 and something. Okay, so x equals 2 is going to be somewhere over here. And we want the tangent to this. We want the equation of the tangent, which is a straight graph. And they give you the hint that it's a straight line graph by using the thing that they say this is the format y is equal to mx plus c. So do you agree, in order to find the equation of the tangent, we need the gradient and we need a point. Okay, we know that x equals 2. So do you agree that we could find the y value of this? If this was 2, we could find the y value by substituting into the original. So let's do that first. We can say f of 2 is equal to 2 cubed minus 4 times by 2 squared minus 11 times by 2 plus 30. Okay, plus 30. So if I do that, I get 8 minus 16 minus 22 plus 30. And it actually ends up equaling 0. So my guess that 2 was around about here was actually a bad guess because actually it's there. Okay, so therefore we can say that that there is the point two zero and that is what the line is going through the tangent is going through that point there okay now i also need so i've got that point there two zero now i need the gradient so how do we get the gradient well this formula is actually the formula of the gradient for every point along this line here okay so if we substitute in f dashed of two I'm going to find the gradient where x equals 2. So we go 3 times 2 squared minus 8 times 2 minus 11. 
which is 3 times 4 is 12, minus 16, minus 11, which ends up being minus 15. So therefore, the gradient at this point is minus 15. So therefore, I can say y is equal to minus 15x plus c. I now can substitute in this point to naught into this to find where it cuts the y-axis, the c. So I can go 0 is equal to minus 15 times by 2 plus c. So therefore, obviously, c is equal to 30. So the equation for this tangent over here is y is equal to minus 15x plus 30. So amazingly, this tangent, yeah, goes through that point there as well. And that's there. Right, let's see what the next question is. It says, explain how the graph of f can be shifted for it to have two equal roots. Okay, so at the moment, this graph has got three equal roots. It's got one over here, one over here, and one over here. Okay, this point here, the y value of it is, okay, the y value of it is 36. And this year, the y value of it is minus 14, comma, 48. Okay. Now, let's think about this. If I move this graph down by 36 units, okay, what's going to happen? This graph is going to just touch or just touch this, right? Okay. And then it will not cross here, and then it will cross further down, further along, okay? Do you agree? So it will go along here, and then it will go up there. And then it will have two real roots, okay? That's the one way. So the one way is to move this graph down by 36 units so that this just touches, okay? And then it touches here. So it's going to have two, right? Then... Okay, but it says they want two equal roots. Two equal roots. Or, because then what happens is this is considered a tangent. So that is called two equal real roots plus the third one. If I move this graph up by 14.48, then it's just going to touch the graph, I mean the x-axis over there. And then I'm going to have two equal real roots over there. So the definition of a graph that has a tangent, in other words where the turning point is just touching the x-axis, is that we say it has two equal real roots at that point. And similarly over here, but that's where it's just touching. It's also got another real root, but to have two equal real roots, it has to just touch. Right, now let's look at question 8.2. It says the diagram below shows the graph of f dashed of x. f dash. So this is the graph of f dashed of x, the derivative. The derivative of ax cubed plus bx squared plus dx plus d. Okay, the graph of f dashed of x intersects at x equals 1 and x equals 5. So what is it telling you? It's saying that f dashed of x equals 0 at x equals 1. f dashed of x equals 0 at x equals 5. Think about what that's telling you, okay? And it says a, which is 4 minus 9, is a point on f dashed of x. Now it says write down the gradient of the tangent to f, to f, at x equals 4. At x equals 4. Well, at x equals 4, what is f dashed of x equal to? f dashed of x equals equal to minus 9. Therefore, we can say the gradient of the tangent to x equals 4 is minus 9. Okay, do you want me to run through it again? Maybe I should. What we're saying is that f dashed of 4 is equal to minus 9. That is what that's been saying there. But f dashed 
of x is a gradient at any point, right? So therefore it's saying that the gradient at x equals 4 is equal to minus 9, and that's what that point is telling you. Now it says determine the x coordinates of the turning points of f. Well, we were told that f dashed of x equals 0 at x equals 1 or at x equals 5. But what do we know? We know that if we have any graph, any graph, any cubic graph like that, for example, the turning points occur where the gradient is zero. In other words, f dashed of x is equal to zero, right? So in other words, these points here are where f dashed of x equals zero. That means that these points are the turning points. So you've got a turning point at x equals one and a turning point at x equals five. I don't know if it's a positive or negative. I just know that that's what it looks like, okay? There's, I do know, but at this point in time, all we're discussing is the fact that there is a turning point at x equals one and a turning point at x equals five. Now it says, for which values of x is f strictly increasing? Which values of x? Okay, so this is a graph of the gradient. Do you agree over here, the gradient is positive, yeah, the gradient is negative, and yeah, the gradient is positive. Okay, that's what's happening. The gradient is positive, then it goes negative, then it goes positive again. So do you agree that this graph is going to be strictly increasing from 1 that way and from 5 that way? So it says for which values of x is f strictly increasing, okay, it's when the graph is actually positive, which would be when x is smaller than 1 or when x is bigger than 5, okay. Now let's do question 9. Just by the way, that's actually a pretty cool question. I just want to show you something here. If we had to look at it, if we had to, the typical question would actually be to say, can you draw the cubic function? We know there's a turning point at x equals 1, okay? And we know there's a turning point at x equals 5, okay? We know the gradient is positive before 1, right? So we know the gradient is positive before 1. We also know the gradient is negative between 1 and 5, and we know the gradient is positive again past 5. So that's more or less the shape of your graph, more or less the shape, okay? You don't know where, uh, where it's cutting the x-axis, we don't know any of that. That's just showing you the shape of the graph from that. Because that there, that positive, represents the positive gradient. This bit here, which is the negative values of the f dash of x is showing you that you've got a negative gradient and that there's a positive gradient again, which is why we can say the graph is strictly increasing with a positive gradient below for x is smaller than one or for big x being bigger than five. Okay, and that's a typical exam question as well, where they are at the level four question, where they ask you to draw more or less a shape for this, okay? They would have to give you more information so you'd be able to give, identify these values, yeah. Okay, let's move on. Right, another application of calculus, okay? A solid square right prism is made up of eight cubic meters of melted metal. Okay, the length of the sides of the base are x meters and the height is h meters and the block will be coated with one layer of paint. Okay, now it says express h in terms of x. Now what have they given you? They have given you the volume. They've given you the volume and they've said that the volume is 8 meters. Now, if you ever struggle with volume, except when it comes to sphere, you can remember that volume is equal to the area, area of the base multiplied by the height. Okay, except for spheres and you know, the funny shaped things like your 
your cones and things, which you actually have to learn, okay? But when it comes to things like your um, your squares and your rect, I mean your your prisms, then you can do area of base times height or your cylinders, okay? So the area of the base is x times by x. So the volume, the volume, can be written as x squared times by the height. But we know the volume is eight, so therefore we've got 8 equals x squared h. Now they've said write h in terms of x. So we're going to solve for h. So h is equal to 8 over x squared. h is 8 over x squared. There we go. Easy peasy. Moving on, it says show the surface area of the block is given by a of x is equal to 2x squared plus 32 over x. Okay, so we now need to use this in an area equation to get this, okay? So what is the surface area? Do you agree we've got one, two, three, four of these, okay? So we've got four rectangles and we've got two of these. We've got a base and we've got a top. So our area of x is going to be 4 times x times h, okay, 4 times x h, plus 2x squared, 2x squared, okay, which is 4x h plus 2x squared, easy peasy, right? But now we're going to substitute for that h, because you'll notice there are no h's here, and they asked us to solve for h here, so we've got 4x times by 8 over x squared plus 2x squared. 4 times 8 is 32, so you've got 32x over x squared plus 2x squared. So we can cancel that with that and we're left with 2x squared plus 32 over x. There we go. Right, next question says, calculate the dimensions of the block that will ensure a minimum quantity of paint is used. Okay, so we're actually wanting to find the derivative of this and that it equals zero. But now I want to give you a tip, grade 12. So the tip is this. If they ask you to show this, they want you to use it. So even if you couldn't do this part of the question, which is worth three marks, just by the way, you can still do this part of the question, which is worth five marks. So even if you couldn't prove this, you can still use this to do the rest of the question. Okay, so let's do that. Whenever you see the words minimum or maximum, I want you to think derivative, okay? Derivative. So we want to know the minimum quantity of paint used and remember the paint is to cover the surface area we're going to paint the thing so we need the surface area so we know that area is equal to 2x squared plus 32 over x and we need to find a dashed of x and is it equal to naught? Whenever you see the words minimum or maximum, you find the derivative and you let it equal naught. So the first thing we need to do is fix that because we don't know how to derive fractions. So, or things with denominator, x in the denominator. So it's gonna be two x squared plus 32 x to the negative one. All right. Now we can find the first derivative. So a dashed of x is going to be 4x minus 32 x to the negative 2. Okay, and now what we're going to do is we're going to let that equal 0 and we're going to solve for x. So the first thing that we're going to do is get rid of, let me just rewrite that, it becomes 4x minus 32 over x squared equals zero and I hate that this x squared is at the bottom so I'm going to multiply the whole thing through by x squared so I end up with 4x cubed minus 32 equals zero and now I'm going to solve for x cubed so we've got 4x cubed is equal to 32 divide both sides by 4 
and I get x cubed is equal to 8 and therefore x is equal to 2. So now we know that the base has to be 2 by 2 but it says calculate the dimension so we need the height as well. But we've already worked out that h is equal to 8 over x squared, right? So therefore that's 8 over 2 squared, which is going to be 8 divided by 4, which is 2 as well. So therefore your h is also going to be 2. Right, happy with that. Right, let's move on to the next question. And we might get lucky, we might actually end up with finishing this paper, I think we will actually, it looks like it, in which case we will be doing circles and circle geometry tomorrow, which is quite exciting for me, I like doing circles and circle geometry. Okay, so let's go through this question. And the question states, the events A and B are independent. The probability of A is 0, 0,4, and the probability of B is naught comma. Sorry, just in a second, I just want to find something quickly. Okay, and the probability of B is naught comma five. Determine the probability of A and B, the probability of A or B, and the probability of not A and not B. The probability of A and B, the probability of A or B, and the probability of not A and not B. Right. So, let's think about this. You guys need to know your rules in order to do this, okay? You have to know your rules. And this is a new section in the curriculum. So, again, it is a section that they love asking and they like making sure that you know it well. So, let's talk about it, okay? The rule for probability of A and B is the probability of A multiplied by the probability of B. That's how easy that rule is. So therefore, this is just going to be 0, 0,4 times 0, 0,5, which if you pop in the calculator is 0, 0,2. Easy peasy, right? Probability of A or B. Now this is a difficult rule to remember, so you must learn it. Okay, please go and learn this rule. It is the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability, sorry, the probability of A and B. That is the rule. And by the way, grade 12, there is a mark allocated for knowing the rule and a mark for the answer. So you actually have to show this rule. You have to write it out. Okay, so that is going to be the probability of A is 0, 0,4 plus the probability of B, which is 0, 0,5, minus the probability of A and B, which we've already worked out, is 0, 0,2. So that becomes 0, 0,7. Easy peasy, right? Rules, you need to study them. Now, we want the probability of not A and not B, okay? So do you agree that that is the same as 1 minus the probability of A or B, A or B, okay? So what does that mean? That means that it's going to be one minus naught comma seven, which is naught comma three. And now you can see why they asked it in this order because you need probability of A and B for probability of A or B, and you need the probability of not A and not B to do the probability, I mean, you need the probability of A or B in order to do the probability of not A and not B. Please go learn these rules. You are really not going to be able to do your statistics and to do this section here on, it's not statistics, sorry, it's probabilities, on probabilities if you do not learn your rules. Okay, let's move on to question 10.2 which I love. I'm sorry, I love these two diagrams. I just do. Okay, it says two identical bags are filled with balls. Bag A contains three pink and two yellow balls. Bag B contains five pink and four yellow balls. Is 
equally likely that bag A or bag B is chosen. Right. Then it says each ball has an equal chance of being chosen from the bag. Okay, so they're not heavier, they're not bigger than each other, they're all equally likely. It says a bag is chosen at random and one ball is then chosen at random from the bag. Okay, so the first thing they're going to ask us to do is represent the information by means of a tree diagram. Clearly indicate the probability associated with each branch of the diagram and write down all the outcomes. Okay, so do you agree we've got first of all two bags, bag A and bag B? Okay, so we have got, let's draw it in the middle. You've got bag A, bag A, and then you've got bag B right and you've got it says it is equally likely that bag a or bag b is chosen equally likely which means you've got a 50 percent chance and a 50 percent chance is represented by a half when we're talking about probabilities and tree diagrams right now in a and b we've got pink balls and yellow balls right so we've got pink balls and we've got yellow balls and we've got pink balls and we've got yellow balls okay right everybody happy with that how many balls do we have in total in pink ball bag a we've got three pink and two yellow so do you agree we've got a total of five balls in bag a three out of the five are pink and two out of the five are yellow so we are going to write three out of the five over here and we're going to write two out of the five are yellow, right? Now we go to the black, blue bag or bag B. We've got five pink and four yellow, which makes nine, nine. And then there are five of them are pink. So five out of the nine are pink and four out of the nine are yellow, right? So that day, is the probabilities okay that's what you needed to write down okay so far right now so the probability here would be bag a choosing pink this would be um getting bag a and then choosing a yellow this would be bag b choosing a pink and this would be bag b choosing a yellow okay so this would be a and then yellow this would be b and then pink and this would be b and then yellow okay happy with that so those are all the outcomes so have we drawn a tree diagram yes have we clearly indicated the probability associated with each of these yes have we written down the outcomes yes Right, next question, it says, what is the probability that a yellow ball will be chosen from bag A? Okay, so what we need to do is look at the fact that we need to look at the probability of choosing a yellow ball from bag A, and it's just two out of five. That's all it is. We are already in bag A, and we now want to know what is the probability of choosing the yellow one. It's two out of five, right. Now it says, what is the probability that a pink ball will be chosen? Ah, so now we're looking for a pink ball in total, right? So that means that we need to work out the fact going along this path or that it could go, wait, wait, let me change color. Do you agree to get pink here, we need to go along this path and then that path. And to get pink here, we need to go along this path and that path, which means we need to get the probability of getting pink is going to be a half multiplied by three over five plus a half multiplied by five over nine, which is going to be three over 10 plus five over 18. And then we need to use our calculators because I don't feel like doing that in my head. So it becomes three over 10 plus, plus five over 18 
equals, and the probability is 26 over 45, which is 0 0.58 or 58%. Okay, so the probability is either 26 over 45, or we could write it as 0 0.58, round it up, or we could say it is 58%. So there's a 58% chance that we would get a pink ball out. Right, now let's do question 10.3, which is our last question. Woohoo! Okay, right. So let's do question 10.3. So we'll definitely be doing circles and circle theorems tomorrow. It says Eastside High School offers only two sporting activities, namely rugby and hockey. Okay, here's your rugby, here's your hockey. The following information is given, and this by the way is a Venn diagram in case you didn't know. The following information is given and partly represented in the diagram. There are 600 learners in the school, so your sample space is 600. 372 learners play hockey. 288 learners play rugby. That doesn't mean it's exclusive. Some of those may have played rugby and some of those may have played hockey. 56 of the learners play no sport. There's our 56 that play no sport. The number of learners that play both hockey and rugby is X. Okay. Now they're saying, write down the values of A and B in terms of X. Well, do you agree that 288 people learned to play rugby? And some of those may have been playing hockey. So therefore, we could say that 288, 288 equals A plus X, right? So do you agree that A, sorry, it says X in terms of A. So X is going to be 288 minus A. Similarly, we've got 372 people that learned how to play hockey, right? So therefore, we know that 372 is equal to B plus X. Therefore, we can say that X is equal to 372 minus B. Right, so now we've got two equations with A's and B's, okay? And now it says calculate the value of X. So I'm actually going to rearrange this instead. Instead, I'm going to work out it says write down the values of MB in terms of X. I've actually written this the wrong way. I'm sorry. This should have been A is 288 minus X and B is 372 minus X. That makes much more sense. Hey? Yeah. So now it says calculate the value of X. So if you think about it, what do we know? We know that A plus X plus B plus 56 has to equal to 600, right? Everything inside of this thing has to equal to 600. So I'm going to erase this writing on the side here. I'm running out of time. Okay, right, so we're going to go A plus X plus B plus 56 is equal to 600. A is 288 minus X plus X plus B is 372 minus X. Okay, plus 56 equals 600. And if you solve that, these cancel and you end up with X is equal to 116. So there are 116 people that played both rugby and hockey. And unfortunately, I have run out of time. So I'm going to answer this about them. Okay, let me just do it quickly. It says, are the events playing rugby and hockey mutually exclusive? Justify your answer. Well, it's pretty obvious that it's not mutually exclusive because of the fact that this does not equal naught. If X equaled naught, then obviously they would not, they would be mutually exclusive. But the fact that there are kids or people that can both play rugby and hockey means that it is not mutually exclusive. 
And that is the end of this paper. Yay! So tomorrow, yes, we will be doing circles and circle geometry. Have a great day.